Success demands sacrifice. Nobody wants to hear that. Discipline of preparation and tenacity. Say, I am a finisher in a world of sprinters. I am a marathon runner in a world of sprinters. We're, we're, I'm a finisher in a world of starters. A lot of people sprint out of the gates. Jesus talked about in the seed and the sower. Many people, because they don't have root in themselves, spring up quickly and fall away. That's, that's just part of life. It's a sad part of life. That's why we want to get your roots founded and grounded in good soil, watered by the Holy Spirit, fed by the miracle grow the Word of God. That's what we want for you. Because if you're not hitting on all cylinders, if you're a, if you're a six-cylinder human and you're hitting on four cylinders, you're losing people in the smoke screen behind you. And you're just, you know, uh, we want you to hit on every cylinder so your life truly glorifies God, spirit, soul, and body in every area of your life. And uh, so success is not what you possess. It's who possesses you. All right. So success is making progress in the direction of God's dreams and purposes for your life. Because if you fulfill your purpose, and I fulfill my purpose, and the other person fills their purpose, we make up God's tapestry, and it's complete. All right. But some of us, we, we don't understand how things work. I, 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 I got me a three-year-old new car, and I, I found out that you can program the garage door to open from the car, not the garage door opener. And, and there's, it's kind of odd, but they put the opener up on the mirror. On the bottom of the mirror, there's three buttons. And I'm like, well, how do you do this? So I'll open up the, on page 37, and it had a diagram. It had a photograph, if you will, an illustration. And there's three buttons, and it said one, two, three, four. Janet said, honey, it says four, but there's only three. I said, that's confusing. So I, I read it. And, and uh, I pulled in the garage and said, let's not get out. Let's program this. So I read the book and I held the button on the remote and I held the button on the mirror and the light went yellow. I thought that's what it's supposed to do. And then, it, then the garage door went down. So then I pushed the button and the garage door stayed down. So I looked at Janet and I said, we need a child to come help us. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, you see a little tiny baby. And they're playing with a phone. And I'm like, how do you do that? So uh, maybe you're like me. Maybe you've read the Bible and read bits and pieces of the Bible, but you're, sure, you're still not sure how this works. So what I'm here for, hopefully, and some of the other leaders in this ministry are here for, is to help you learn how it works. How many of you don't really care how the car works as long as it starts and stops the way it's supposed to? Okay, that's the way most of us are. So... But here's the thing, when you understand how the car works and why it works, then some of these things make better sense and they become more effective. So I just want you to know, I still don't know how to get the garage door up and down. When all else fails, you pull that cord and you just pull it down. Uh, but that's part of what we're here to help you migrate through life. And so uh, success will only happen if you throw off every weight and sin. Every weight and sin. So in the life of Abraham, who is the, the uh, father, according to Romans 4, Abraham's the father of our faith. Jesus, according to Romans 12, is the, the captain of our salvation. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. But according to Scripture, Abraham's the father of our faith. So we find Abraham. God has chosen Abram. And his name changed later to Abraham, which is a whole other part of this series. And God chose Abraham, a physical person, so we could see God moving physically in people's lives. So we could learn a lesson through observation. Not just some spiritual, deep, secret revelation. We can see it working. Uh, Philip said to Jesus, show us the Father and be satisfied. And then Jesus said, Philip, you've seen me physically. You've seen me. If you've seen me, You've seen the Father. So let me just throw this out there for your kind consideration. If you didn't see Jesus do it, then don't put it off on the Father. That's deeper than some of you just grunted. All right. So uh, here's what Scripture says. Therefore, since we're surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. Throw off everything that hinders. Everything that hinders you. 
See, I'm wearing my Cayman boots. Cayman alligator, I think is what those things are. How many of you believe that if I was going to run a race, even though I'm over 25, that I could probably run it faster if it wasn't too far, <laughs> if I took the boots off and put on tennis shoes? I could run quicker. I could be faster. Now, I'm not sure it helped me much in endurance, but I promise you, some people in this room could outrun me if I'm, chasing, if I'm running in the boots and you're running barefoot or in tennis shoes. And outside today, if you're barefoot, I guarantee you'd outrun me because you'd want to go get your socks and shoes back on. So what, what Scripture is telling us here, since we're in a race, we've got to put off everything that hinders or entangles us. That's, that's a tough life lesson. Now, can I be just as kind and as honest and transparent as possible with you about you today? Most people, most people in church do not want to go to church and hear about warfare. They want to hear uplifting, exciting, inspirational messages. And, and I understand that, and I want to be that for you. But I, I know it sounds repetitive for me to keep telling you you're in a war. We can, we can live in America and ignore there's a war going on in other areas, very overt wars in the Middle East. Is that true? When I was in the Army and when I trained for Vietnam, my drill sergeant, now this is not an excuse for me to be rude, I'm just making a point about my drill sergeant. My drill sergeant didn't care. George, you were in the Army. George, did your drill sergeant ever ask you if you liked him? <laughs> Do you think he cared? What was the motivation of my drill sergeant to keep me alive and prepare and train me, sometimes harshly? Because if I wasn't adequately equipped for war, then my comrades in arms, my brothers in arms, my sisters in arms, they're dependent on me to be prepared. So if I'm not prepared, they may die. And my drill sergeant wanted us to win and to come home alive. And so I know it's a bit repetitive and sometimes frustrating to keep being told you're in warfare. Why? Because Jesus said when he comes back, he's coming in a time that people will be marrying and giving in marriage. And they'll be going on about the daily routine of their life. And it's so easy to get caught in the daily routine of life and not get ourselves ready for what's coming What our enemy is prepared and preparing to do to us. If I showed you my prayer list of all the people that I pray for in this church and in, in your families every day, some of you would go, oh, that's depressing. But see, it's not depressing because I know we win. Now, to put this in context, sometimes maybe I come across strong. Would anybody agree kindly? That sometimes I come across strong. Sometimes my mama did too. <laughs> Stronger than I prefer sometimes. But this past week, I was sharing some in at a, a lunch the other day on Wednesday. This past week, I had two young people that are now in their 40s. They were in my youth department in the late 1980s. Hadn't heard from them since I left. That position at another church, January 1st, 1988. Hadn't heard from them in almost 30 years. But one's mom is in extreme traumatic life experience right now. Fighting for her life. The other one going through a major life traumatic event. And who'd they reach out to? Now let me just be fair. At least one of those two girls was not always the most supportive and encouraging young person in my youth ministry. <laughs> but who'd they reach out to? Someone that they love and someone they know loves them. And someone they believe loves them enough and loves Jesus enough that in a traumatic event, after 29 plus years, they reached out because they believe that I might be able to pray and believe with them and somehow break through this traumatic minefield. So what's my point? Sometimes we get so interested in being liked, winning the popularity contest, that we prefer being liked over being loved and respected. 
Listen, I was voted the most friendly in my senior class at Little Rock Central High School. What did that get for me? <laughs> I got a certificate. But being liked is wonderful. I, I don't know that I've ever met anybody that doesn't want to be liked. Even somebody says, I don't care if you like me or not. It's just the way I am. People still want to be liked. Everybody wants to be loved. But sometimes we sacrifice being liked for being loved. And if I have to let you choose, and sometimes you do have to make this choice. Pastor wasn't very likable today. He seemed harsh. <laughs> it's because I'm in war. I'm the drill sergeant. And I'm trying to get you to own the fact that there are booby traps everywhere you go every day. And I want you to be prepared and ready. I don't want you to be a statistic. I want you to call me and say, Pastor, I just want you to know I love you and God's blessing me and my family's happy. Oh, we're all serving the Lord. I, 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 I don't mind when you call and say, listen, we're in a struggle and we're fighting for, the, for our lives. Will you pray for me? But I really want you to know how to fight the good fight of faith. And success is moving and growing in the direction God has for you. And sometimes there are people in our lives that are not encouraging they actually undermine our faith. How about this one? Oh, girlfriend, you deserve better than him. And you hear that enough, you begin to agree with that. And I'm just telling you, half of the church of Jesus Christ has been divorced. And I'm not down on you because you've been divorced, because I do believe in God a second chance. I have a ministry called Second Chance. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you, God hates divorce because of the collateral damage and if you come like I have from a divorced home where my mom and dad split up when I was 14, it affects you. It affects you big time. It affects our kids. So when you have enough outside voices throwing contention and dissension and division in your life, you've got to be cautious. So Abraham has been told to leave his family and to travel to go to a distant country and live by faith. And God's teaching him how to live by faith. And therefore, he's showing us we're all learning how to live by faith. Do you understand? We are all learning how to live by faith. And God takes Abraham, and he's showing us Abraham. Abraham goes off on this journey, but he allows someone to go along with him, and he brings his family and all of his, uh, all of his staff, all of his herd, herds and herdsmen. And as they're traveling, all of a sudden there's contention, there's strife. Abraham in Genesis says this to Lot in verse uh, 8 of chapter 13. He says, he calls Lot, who happens to be his nephew. And I believe that Abram let him come on the trip because Lot's father had died. And Abram's his uncle. God told him to leave his family, his extended family, and take his immediate family and go on a journey. He didn't mean to be disobedient. He was trying to be compassionate. And Lot's on the journey, and they have been getting to prosper, and their herdsmen begin to argue. Well, that's, that's Abraham's sheep. No, 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 that's Lot's sheep. No, 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 that's Lot's donkey. And they start having arguments. It says, we don't, Abraham says, I don't want there to be quarreling. Abraham says in one translation, let there not be any strife among us. I looked the word strife or quarreling up in the original Hebrew, and it means contention. Sometimes, listen, sometimes we've got to get the strife out of our life. So we can see clearly what God has for us. So Abram says, I don't want there to be any strife or quarreling between your herdsmen and my herdsmen or between you and me. So here's what Abram does. He doesn't say, get on out of here. This is mine. What he says is, Lot, let there not be any strife. You go whichever way you want to go and I'll go the other way. He put him first. And the Bible says, Lot looked up, well, this is powerful, Lot looked up and saw the plains down by Sodom and Gomorrah. You probably know that story, huh? How'd that work out? Lot looked up and one translation says, chose for himself. And off he went. It said it was, the plains were like the Garden of Eden. He was moved by his soulish desires. But Abram said, you just look up and you go your way. I'll take, le I'll take the leftovers. As soon as he left, all of a sudden things begin to get clear. Hi, everybody. Perry Black right here at Arkansas Christian Academy. And I want to take this moment to just say thank you for looking at our website. I know you've got a lot of questions and they say a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, let me tell you, take a tour of Arkansas Christian Academy. That's worth a million words.
why don't you schedule a tour today, 501-847-0112. We look forward to hearing from you because spring registration is getting ready to open up. And in order to keep our classes small, maximum of 18 students per teacher or less, then we've got to know who's coming in the fall. And so we're getting ready to open up and I look forward to hearing from you and meeting you, your family, your children, and watching them grow, not only in educational excellence, but character, integrity, and Christ-likeness. I look forward to seeing you again right here on our website, but more importantly, right here on our campus. Until then, I'll see you. God bless. You know what strife does? It drains you of your energy. It distorts your focus. I mean, when you're in a contentious relationship, it's just draining. Anybody, anybody been there? And when you've got people at work, God forbid it be people from church, oh, you deserve better than him. Oh, she not treating you right. You need you another one. Oh, your parents. Your parents are foolish. Who are they to put their Victorian Christian beliefs on you? Be a self-thinker. When you've got that stuff going on, guys, that's strife. That's contention. Here in this ministry, I have told this staff numerous times over the past 27 years, we are not here to take sides against the decision that any parent makes. We may not agree with every decision a parent makes. I don't have to. And they don't have to agree with everything I, every decision I make. But we are here to come alongside mom and dad, or mom, or dad, and undergird what you're teaching your children and lead by example ourselves. Is that fair? And all of February, we're committing to uh, family relationships. How to be successful, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're divorced, is how to be a strong family. And we say here at Family Church, we are a spiritual family. We want to be a part of your family. We want you to be a part of a family. Gang members beat each other, just beat the piddly poo out of each other and call that loving them in. And they become a part of a gang. We have a desperate need in us to be a part of something bigger than us. And more significant than us. That makes us feel like we can do something. Don't you? That's what churchianity is not. What Christianity it is. It is a family. And guys listen to me. There's not enough room in this community for churches besides us. There's room in this world and in this community for other Christians to worship different from us. We are all part of the same family of God, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are all going to the same heaven if we're all saved. There's room. The kingdom of heaven will suffer it violent, and the violent take it by force. And the reality is this. The church of Jesus Christ cannot be defeated by the devil, and we are not in competition with one another. We're all part of the body of Christ. Give the Lord a shout. All right. Now, we may, we may differ on immersion or sprinkling and some of those other things, but we're all part of the body of Christ. And the Holy Spirit, if we'll remain tender and get out of strife and contention in our relationships. Now, that's not permission to leave a husband. That's not a permission to leave your parents. It's not a permission to leave your wife. But strife and contention, man, be wise. Abraham's showing us. Romans 12, 16, New Testament, live in harmony with one another. You know, did y'all notice we had four ladies up here singing? Beautiful singers. Oh, but you know what? They were harmonizing. I even verified they were harmonizing, not just singing together. They're harmonizing. They're all singing the same song. They all have a unique voice. They're all singing, I think, in the same key, but one may be a soprano, one may be a alto, one may be a, a tenor, a tenor or 11. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a man, so what am I? I'm not a bass. Baritone. Mama sing bass, daddy sing tenor. No, that's wrong. Anyway. <laughs> but do you notice they were singing the same song in the same way, but they were singing it uniquely themselves? What if, what if Grayson would have just decided over on the drums? I'm uniquely me. I'm not going to beat the drum according to the beat it's supposed to. I just want to do my own thing. See, that's strife and contention. Yeah, but I'm unique. No, no. You're not going to play the drums. 
Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, put that up there. Romans, look, if it is possible, that means it's not always possible to get along with everybody. Remember, you're wanting to be loved more than you want to be liked. And being loved and not being liked doesn't mean you have to be rude or harsh or, or uh, mean or, or hard-headed. All right. So if it is possible, as far as it depends on you. So that means you just do your part, you love people, you're kind, you're generous, you're supportive, you're encouraging, you're a thousand beams of light, whether they even light up or not. You do everything possible as far as it depends on you to live at peace with everybody. Sometimes that means you apologize even though you don't think you're responsible for it. Because if you apologize, they think they're right. Listen, just do your part. Look at the person beside you and say, he's meddling now. So Lot lifted up his eyes. Lot chose for himself. We cannot see clearly when our perspective is blurred by strife or unforgiveness. Mark 11, uh, Jesus said this. I think it's 23. could be verse 24. Jesus said this. When you stand praying, forgive. How many times? Well, seven times seven is what Jesus said. That means endlessly. Oh, oh, that's hard. Yeah. That's why you got to be not drunk with wine is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit in excess. Because it's hard, yeah. It's a choice you make. Hey everybody, it's Perry Black right here at Destin Win TV, and I want to take a moment to give you a chance to prayerfully consider changing the world. You say, well, how can I change the world? Let me tell you, years ago when I traveled in ministry before we started Destin Win TV, I had three little girls in Benton, Arkansas, gathered daddy's change every day. And the first of every month, I got a gift from those three precious little girls changing the world to this day. You can change the world 70 cents a day, $20 a month, by simply taking your change, throwing it into the same spot day after day after day, and then sending it to help us change the world at Second Chance Youth Ranch. Why don't you go right now to cyr.org and we'll answer all of your questions and connect with you if you'll just change the world with your change. I look forward to hearing from you right here at Destiny TV. Until then, I'll see you here, there, or in the air. God bless. So you got to stay focused on the vision. Don't get it blurred by strife and contention and people speaking into your life that are not lining up their words with the words of God. Okay? Do that for you. Stay focused. And as soon as the contention and strife and the quarreling was no longer in Abram's life, Lot looked out and chose for himself. Well, that seems natural. As soon as he left... It says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. We'll continue that later. Then God says, Abram, lift up your eyes. And as far as you can see, I give that to you. That's what they're fighting on, fighting about right now in Jerusalem and in Israel. That's what they're fighting about right now. Abram, I give this to you. Now listen to what he says. Now, go walk through the land. What's he doing? The just shall live by faith and not by sight. But what God's doing is stimulating Abraham, learning how to live by faith, by getting him with clarity of vision to go walk through and see what God already sees. That's powerful. That's powerful. I truly believe oftentimes God puts mentors in our life so we can see what we've heard to be possible. Heads bowed and eyes closed. You're here today. What I want you to see is God's great possibilities for you. Let's just do it just for a moment. It's not quite 12 o'clock. Let's just take a few seconds. You fighting the good fight of faith for healing? 
I want you to see yourself running and leaping and praising God. That's Acts 3. That man who had been lame for 40 years. Lame from his mother's womb. And he went leaping and dancing and praising God. And everybody in the temple saw him. Oh, it was quite a ruckus. What is it that, that's happening in your life? I want you to see yourself happy. I want to see your family in unity. I want to see you. I want you to see you prospering in the directions that God has for you, fulfilling His purpose. I don't want you to see where you're stuck. I don't want to see where you've fallen down. I want you to see yourself standing tall in faith. The just shall live by faith and not by sight. If you want to see a physical manifestation of a failure that God has turned from a mess into success, you don't have to look anywhere but right here on this stage. You're not looking at perfection except in the eyes of God. But in the natural, He's taken a mess and turned it into success. Someone like me that's just walking through the land. Showing people how God can work in you and work through you in spite of you. And you're here today and you say, you know what, I just want to serve God. I just want to get back on track. I'm starting a new year. I'm looking for God to do something practical and real, not magical and spectacular. Something practical and something real. I want people to see me walk through the land. I want people to see me live in the dreams and plans and purposes that are down hidden latently in my heart. Pray this with me out loud, would you? Heavenly Father, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died on the cross. Now listen, if you've never repented and acknowledged you're a sinner, just say this with me right now, everybody. I once was lost, but I'm trusting Jesus right now to take my heart and to take my life and to take my sins. I believe He died for me. I believe on the third day He rose again. And Jesus is alive. And I receive Him as my Savior. And by faith, I make Him Lord of my life. I'm going to come through the other side of this. And what would have made me bitter is going to make me better. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hi, this is Perry Black, and I want to let all of our viewers know that all of my messages are free, and you can download those at familychurchbryant.org, and I'll see you next week right here on BTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection.